Hello there, everybody, and welcome to Things We Said Today, our weekly virtual podcast where we discuss all matter of things relating to the Beatles, their their history, what's happening now, and what may be happening in the future. Uh, I'm Al Sussman from Beatle Fan Magazine, and I'm here with my, my three co-hosts. First of all, the host of the rapidly expanding syndicated Beatles show, Every Little Thing, and that's Ken Michaels. Hey, Ken. Thank you, Al. You've been paying attention to my Facebook post. Yes, I have. <laughs> we'll have no, to I, have admit- something, I have something like 20 to 21 stations now. Before the end of the show, we'll have to take a, a, a tour through the last, uh, you know, the, the, the recent editions. Okay, sure. Definitely. Hi, everybody, and Happy New Year. <laughs> and uh, and our uh, our resident uh, rock journalist, Beatles uh, journalist, who does uh, freelance work for Billboard magazine and uh, axes.com, axs.com, and various other uh, sources, and that's uh, Steve Marinucci. Hey, Al. Uh, hello, everyone. Happy New Year. Happy New Year uh, to you, too, and to everybody. And our uh, resident musicologist, uh, longtime classical music uh, contributor, classical music reviewer for the New York Times. And as a matter of fact, um, a new piece by uh, Mr. Cozen uh, is uh, uh, currently, in fact, it uh, reached the, the, the Times website, I believe, on Sunday and mm-hmm. uh, the print paper today. I think uh, it was the Monday. Times website had it Saturday night, um, and then oh, okay, yeah, and that's a uh, um, it's apropos of what we're, we're going to be talking about, and uh, that of course is Alan Cozen. Hello, Al. Hello, everyone, and happy New Year. Happy New Year to you. And um, unfortunately, we're going to be talking about something that we spent a lot of time talking about during 2016. And that's death. It, 2016 seemed to be, it was one of those years when there seemed to be an awful lot of notable pop culture figures, um, figures, celebrity figures, any number of, uh, 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 of prominent figures in, in history who departed this life during 2016. And uh, the music world seemed to be particularly hard hit. And we, um, in the two weeks since we last uh, gathered together, uh, we've gotten uh, another cluster of um, what you might call departures from uh, from this life. Two significant figures in the uh, the early formative years of the Beatles, and uh, and two. Uh, pop culture figures with connections to one or more uh, of the Beatles. So I think first we're going to start back on, um, on Christmas Day with the passing of George Michael, who was a major pop star in the, in the 80s and early 90s. And um, I had actually forgotten, um, and uh, you know, uh, probably a lot of people had forgotten the fact that actually he has a connection with Paul McCartney, and Ken will explain that to us. Well, I know it, it probably started with uh, a concert that took place in 1999. There was a tribute concert to Linda McCartney that happened at the Royal Albert Hall. And George Michael performed there, and as a tribute to Linda, he performed The Long and Winding Road. And he also performed one of his huge hits, which was Faith. And if mm. you've ever gotten to see that concert, you should watch his performance of The Long and Winding Road. He, you know, George Michael, to me, was an amazing singer. He listened to the way that he delivers The Long and Winding Road to perfection. And especially when it comes to ballads, in his career, he was he had one of the most powerful voices I've ever heard. But um, he was there for that concert. He later appeared with Paul McCartney on stage when mm-hmm. Paul was at Live 8. And um, he and his band, Paul and his band, did Drive My Car. And George Michael ran up on stage and sang it with Paul. And then, um, not long after that, 
George Michael released a duet with Paul McCartney for a song called Heal the Pain, which was actually an older song of George's, and it was on his album Listen Without Prejudice, which came out in mm. 1991. And um, it's really a beautiful duet, and Paul and George Michael sound fantastic. Their voices blended well together. I played that song a lot on my own radio show on Every Little Thing, and every time I played it, I always said I wish those two did more together because their voices just sounded so good together. <laughs> but uh, there are those three connections right there with George Mike. And Paul himself issued a statement, you know, mm-hmm. his sorrow over, over his death. And uh, a tremendous loss. I mean, we, we've had so many losses this past year. and It's, it's really hard to comprehend it all. And for yeah. me, whenever it's someone this young, and George Michael was only 53. That's the shocking like, thing. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, and Prince also was, I think, 57. 50, uh, 58. 58. Okay. Yeah. So when you think about it, we've lost almost all the biggest hit makers of the 80s. <laughs> yeah. Oh, uh, you know, Michael Jackson, Prince, now George Michael. I mean, Madonna's still here. <laughs> uh, right. Madonna. Whitney Houston. Well, with, yeah, exactly. So when it's a decade that's only a few decades ago, you know, you expect yeah. it. So when, it's, uh, when you're going back to the 50s and 60s, you kind of expect it. When it's the 80s and someone this young, I mean, I, I just couldn't believe it. I actually found out from Steve's post <laughs> on Facebook mm-hmm. about it, and I just couldn't believe it. I'm stunned, you know. And I realize probably we should accept this easier as time goes on. But when it's someone this young, I, I don't know if I ever can totally comprehend it. Right. Have- you, you, you can kind of accept somebody who passes when they're in their, you know, in, in their 70s, late 60s, in their 70s, beyond that. But 53, in this yeah. day and age, that's awful young. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and they, they have not, as of, uh, I'm looking now, what we're doing this and they have not come up with a cause of right. That's right. going to be, the, that's going to be the big question. Yeah. yeah. They still have not really conclusively come up with a, a cause of death. Mm-hmm. Well, they have reported that he suffered a lot from depression. Right. And um, he did have drug problems. Mm-hmm. So uh, we don't know if that was the cause or not. But uh, from my own perspective, I just think George Michael was a brilliant, brilliant artist. And even though my knowledge of him doesn't go that much beyond his hits and the Faith album, just that album alone was was an amazing it's one of the best albums of the 80s and and kind of like what i admire in a lot of artists who really stretch and do a lot of different styles george michael was a lot like that you know mm-hmm. and just an incredible voice i mean just listen to a song like one more try which is one of the <laughs> i mean he could have easily have been uh, a torch singer you know yeah or, it, it was, that's a wonderful record yeah, mm-hmm. and uh, the first song that actually was a, a solo hit for George Michael um, was called A Different Corner. And it's one that doesn't get airplay all that much, but give a listen to that. That's an amazing, beautiful song and powerful vocals from that. But for anyone that has never investigated George Michael, go on YouTube, listen, listen to his stuff. He, he, was, he was really extremely talented. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And, you know, you mentioned the fact that he had had bouts with depression. Yeah. Uh, in, in 1990, he did an interview with um, Robert Hilburn for mm. the uh, Los Angeles Times, their calendar, uh, I guess, Sunday magazine. And he said, uh, and I'm quoting, I'm not stupid enough to think that I can deal with, uh, with another 10 or 15 years of major exposure. See, uh, um, I think that is the uh, the ultimate tragedy of fame. People who are simply out of control, who are lost. I've seen so many of them, and I don't want to be another cliche. Mm. Now, <laughs> among the people who who saw that particular interview was Frank Sinatra. Right. And he um, he sent a letter in, and uh, and. You have to remember that at that point in time, Frank Sinatra was probably uh, one of four people in the world who knew the kind of mega fame that 
he had had, and the other three were the then three surviving ex Beatles. Uh-huh. And what um, what the chairman had to say in part was, um, I don't understand a guy who lives quote, in hopes of reducing the strain of his celebrity status, unquote. Here's a kid who, quote, wanted to be a pop star since I was about seven years old, unquote. And now that he's a smash performer and songwriter at 27, he wants to quit doing uh, what tons of gifted youngsters all over the world would shoot grandma for, just Mm. one crack uh, at what he's complaining about. Come on, George, loosen up. Swing, man. <laughs> dust, off, dust, off, dust off those gossamer wings uh, and fly yourself to the moon of your, of your choice and be grateful to carry the, uh, the baggage we've all had to carry since uh, those lean nights of sleeping on buses and, and helping the driver unload the instruments. And no more of that talk about the tragedy of fame. The tragedy of fame is when no one shows up and you're singing to the cleaning lady in some, uh, in some empty joint that hasn't seen a paying customer since St. Swith, uh, Swithin's Day. And you're nowhere near that. You're top dog on the, uh, on the top rung of a tall ladder called stardom, mm. which in Latin means thanks to the fans who were there when it was lonely. Mm-hmm. That's the chairman of the board countering, well, yeah. countering George Michael. I'm sure there's a lot of people that, mm-hmm. that read that letter and agreed with Frank. Mm-hmm. But everybody responds to fame in different ways. I mean, all you got to do is study the Beatles and you'd know that. Right. Because, uh, I mean, look at George. George was the first one who really didn't find happiness in this level of fame and he was looking for something else and even john wasn't all that happy and he would often feel guilty for for the fame that he got that he didn't deserve it you know so everybody has a different way of handling fame and i think frank was in that generation where you know depression wasn't really taken seriously as a as yeah you know a a problem Mm -hmm. that's a good point yeah, you know, if you had, if you were depressed, you, you, <laughs> you, you buried it under a, uh, you know, a, hmm. uh, a glass of Jack Daniels. <laughs> well, you know, there, there's a little similarity here between uh, George Michael and George Harrison in a way, because I always remember that George Harrison said that he couldn't handle the mania or the adulation. Yes, and there's there's a difference between being appreciated. And being idolized, you know, and, 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 you know, the adulation. And I think George Michael expressed some of the same words mm. in his career. So, mm. uh, you know, he liked being a success, but he didn't like the craziness and, and the idolatry that he had to face, which I think was, was more in England than in here. Because right. his success continued more in England. Whereas mm-hmm. in the 90s, the 90s, he had some hits here. It wasn't nearly what he had in the 80s no i mean the faith album was was a monster mm-hmm. and, you know it was it was almost kind of you know in the category of thriller you know it, it had a lot of hits from that album so he got constant airplay you know but at the same time though um there were aspects of of michael that that were kind of at least to me were a little irritating the whole listen, listen without prejudice thing i mean kind of dictating to people how they you know how they should listen to him i i never i never bought into that i never thought that was a good a good move on his part explain but, the uh listen without prejudice well i mean that was the title of the album that was the title ah, of his album right. and and mm-hmm. and and you know you're basically telling people you know i mean you're you know you're basically you know ordering people uh how to uh you know how to appreciate something and i and and that you know that kind of that's a little too presumptuous you know uh it's just it just doesn't work but i mean you know maybe there was a you know maybe there was another thing going on there that i mean i have to admit i, I wasn't a big fan of his but and I, but i do you know i do like some of the songs that he did but that was kind of a that was kind of a bad move on I think on his part and not to not to slag him a whole bunch after he's gone but I'm just saying that you know that kind of dictating your stardom does not work so I don't know 
So in any event. No, I think he was a tremendous talent. And I no, think I, I'm, you, not, I'm, I'm not saying he wasn't tremendous. I'm just saying that kind of, that kind of uh, playing that kind of game. Uh, I mean, to a certain extent, Lady Gaga is doing the same thing. You know, with changing every every you know every time she comes comes out. You know, the continual evolution. Although know. a thing with her, it seems that she, I think I think her association with Tony Bennett has been a good thing. Mm-hmm. Because I, I've noticed that you know recently, and especially with this last album, she's gotten away from the gimmicks and the costumes and mm-hmm. all the and all the nonsense, and she's you know letting her considerable talent speak for her. He has a way of getting of doing that. I mean, look what he did mm-hmm. with King, Katie Lang. I mean, that yes. was that was really that was a great album the two of them did together. Yeah. So, well, you know. Yeah. So yeah, that's that's a good point. But um, mm-hmm. anyway, Absolutely. enough about we're not talking about Tony Bennett. Yes, so. yeah, Tony. Yeah, Tony is still here. Tony and, is still here, <laughs> and Lady just Gaga turned, is still just, here, and just Katie turned Lang nine. Just turned ninety. Still, act, so. Is still here. Yeah. But we did have this um, <laughs> incredibly sad story that uh, that. Um, morphed over the course of Christmas weekend and into uh, this this past week with on the Friday before Christmas, uh, Carrie Fisher having a serious either heart attack or stroke. I've heard different uh, different accounts uh, on a plane uh, going into LAX, and uh, and by the following Tuesday she had uh, she had passed on. To be followed a day later by her mother, Debbie mm-hmm. Reynolds. Right. And uh, but uh, um, Steve was one of the first people to uh, to bring up the fact that uh, that there are also some. There is a well, as it turns out, more than one connection, if a Beetle World connection uh, involving Carrie Fisher. Uh, one is certainly with uh, with a Beetle, Ringo Starr. And mm-hmm. one with a uh, a beetle son. Well, uh, I mean, everybody, uh, all the reports, you know, uh, focused in on all all the things that Sean Lennon said, and how they were close friends. But it was funny that a couple of weeks before that, I was in a local record store, and I was going through their bargain section, and they and I found the EPK for Friendly Fire for Sean's album, and the DVD has. It has Carrie in it, and mm-hmm. I just posted actually this afternoon, posted the video that she's in, and I ha- I haven't had a chance to look up to see if there's more stuff that she did with him, but somebody told me that she has written songs with him, and she also was one of the artists against fracking that that you know that campaign that he and Yoko were heavily into. So there was there was a connect uh, the the friendship connection. And of course, he posted those great pictures. The one of the two of them back to back hugging each other was just was just a tearjerker. Mm. Um, but there was a definite, you know, there was a definite uh, connection there between the two of them, and and it's you know it's beautiful that uh, that that connection is is known. And it was more than just a friendship. I mean, there was there was an art uh, you know artistic uh, connection as well as a friendship. And well, Sean, that- Sean did say. I mean, they had something in common there. Being the child of someone really famous and how to do that, sure. so right. you know they can relate on that level, and right? But it was it was more than that though. I mean, there was more going on. I mean, they shared they shared political beliefs. They shared, um, you know, they shared. Uh, they, he, she contributed to his music, so um, there's yeah, there's a little more to it than that. But that's that's. Again, that's the whole thing is really sad, especially the the part about Debbie Reynolds. I mean, that just, and at the end of the year, that just made you want to break down. Uh, you know, just uh, that was just a horrible, horrible end to the to the year. Incredibly so, sad. Yeah, incredibly, incredibly sad. And then the Ringo connection. Yes, you were going to talk about the, right. The other, the and other, that the was, other. and that was really very shortly after she became famous as Princess yes. Leia. It was like a year later, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, mm-hmm. she appeared in um, Ringo's TV special, uh, right? What was that called? I can't remember the name. 
I Ringo. think I think officially it was just called Ringo, but it's, yeah. it's become known as the Ogner the Ogner Rats. Rats. <laughs> and right. some some irreverent souls have uh, have brought up the fact that in the that um, in the same year, uh, Carrie Fisher appeared in the Ogner Rats special, and in the legendarily bad Star Wars Christmas special. I tried to watch that this Christmas, and uh, it's hard to get through that thing. I'll tell you, it really, really, really is. It's bad. It is bad. I mean, they were all. It, I, I guess uh, Hamill was. Or she was supposed to be. Well, let's put it this way: they were not all. Uh, yeah, they were. Uh, they were enjoying that. Let's put it that way. Um, but uh, wow. I really like the Ognarat special, though. I mean, I, I don't know. It's everyone sort of dismisses it, but I, I thought it was a lot of fun. Um, it had a great cast. Besides Carrie mm-hmm. Fisher, there was Art Carney as Art Ringo's Carney. father. Yeah. Carrie mm-hmm. Fisher was his girlfriend. John Ritter. Uh, John Ritter. Uh, mm-hmm. Angie Dickinson was wasn't she? Yep. In it? Uh, uh-huh. Yep. And uh, you know, we've a lot of us have seen the outtakes of. Of that, and it's astonishing that they were able to even get a special together, given the way the outtakes look. But um, mm. because this was before Ringo went to become uh, sober, mm-hmm. yes, <laughs> and you know it's 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 hard to watch. I mean, it's not even really funny or anything. It's just you know bad. But nevertheless, they got together a, a TV special in which, you know, the, it's sort of like a Prince and the Pauper kind of story where Ringo switches identity with Agner Ratz, who's a, you know, tour guide, uh, you know, mm-hmm. the, the stars' yep. houses and, and mm-hmm. all that. And then at the end, you know, they're trying to put together a Ringo special and, uh, you know, basically the idea is to do a bunch of songs from... Um, you know, I guess what was it? Bad Boy probably was the album. Yeah, at the time. Uh, yes, that was it. There were yeah. there were three three songs that he and his band did at the time, and yeah. that's you know I haven't seen the special for quite a while, but that's what I always remember most. Yeah, hard on my three sleeve. songs live. Yeah, yeah. Hard Times was on there. It was yeah. a good mm-hmm. version of that. Yep. Yeah. that's a good rock song. Hard Times and a cameo from George Harrison too. Let's not forget. Mm-hmm. Right. So. Mm-hmm. And uh, and I'm, if I I'm, remember, I'm, uh, wasn't a man like me over the uh, the mm-hmm. credits at the end. Mm-hmm. And I don't. And we're forgetting. We're forgetting Carrie Fisher sang "You're 16 with Ringo. Right. That's right. Yeah. Yes. So, but I didn't see it mentioned in a single obit. I mean, apart from Steve. Um, I was going to say it. Steve. Uh, I know Steve posted it, but that was yeah. about. Uh, that was about it. Yeah, I'd well, been thinking think of sending a note in to my pals at the time, saying, "Hey, <laughs> hey, Beatles connection," you know. <laughs> yeah. But uh, yeah, yeah, well, uh, you know, it's it's you know all the people, you know, all the accounts. Basically, everything was about. Star Wars, Princess Leia, and you know, totally forgot the you know the ha- Hannah and her sisters, uh, the fact that she was in Shampoo with uh, right. Warren Beatty when she Warren was Beatty. what seventeen or eighteen years old. Mm-hmm. Uh, the, the Blues you know, Brothers, had, I think the Blues Times Brothers Obit had those. Yeah. Yes. Uh, yeah, she was in an awful lot of stuff, really. Uh, mm-hmm. When Harry met Sally. Yeah. You know, she was kept fairly busy. Yeah, she had a you know she had a very a much more uh, you know a much more diverse career than you would you would think from at least some of you know not so much the times obit uh, and we'll be getting into times obits in a moment because uh, <laughs> somebody here has written one very recently mm-hmm. um, but in most of the other obits uh, in you know in pop culture land it was basically a one trick pony there you know it was just princess leia princess leia princess leia yeah, yeah. and that's very so, sad it really is you know when you're dealing with something that's a dynasty like star wars has become mm-hmm. you know it's just amazing 40 years later <laughs> how big star wars is oh same my thing God. with you know star trek or you know yeah. It's a franchise, and yeah. it's something that never dies. It just keeps growing and growing and growing. You mm-hmm. know? It's like, in, in many ways, you can say the Beatles are that way. Mm-hmm. Oh, even though, no even, even though they broke up in 1970, there's continuing interest you know, from different sure. releases that come out through the years, and it never goes away. And it's almost like no matter what Carrie Fisher did the rest of her life, 
if you're part of the Star Wars team, that's it. That's what you're going to be known for for the rest of your life. More right. than anything else. Kind of like yeah. being a pistol. I was going to say, it's like what Paul said to Ringo. Uh, I'll clean it up and say, uh, you know, you're a, you're a, you're a friggin' beetle. <laughs> yeah. I have a feeling, though, that now um, as people uh, end up, you know, binging out on Netflix or whatever now and then, they're going to run into a lot of films that Carrie Fisher was in and they'll say, oh, hey, there's Carrie Fisher. And I mean, as a Matt. Know, yeah. As a matter of fact, last just last night, I watched uh, HBO uh, is showing. I think they had already scheduled it uh, anyway to uh, showing her her one woman show from I guess uh, four or five years ago called Wishful Drinking. Yeah, and it's if you've never seen it, it's fabulous. Hmm. It really is. But, you know, the Sean connection was new to me, I mean, until he posted his inst- first Instagram thing and, and talked about how close they were. I, I, I had no idea. And uh, mm. so, I mean, if they wrote songs yeah. together, I, I'd really be interested in hearing them. And um, I hope he yeah, does, does I, put I, those I, out. I, yeah, I haven't. I mean, I, other than, I, don't, I didn't know that. Somebody commented on what I had written this afternoon, so I, I hadn't heard that before. But if if that is indeed true, yeah, that would be interesting yeah, to see. It is true because Sean, it it's Sean that said it. Sean okay. said he wrote a few songs with her, and he's considering mm. releasing them. Oh, okay. And next, we have two major figures in the formative years of the Beatles who who passed within uh, within about six days of each other. Um, One is uh, Sam Leach, who was um, perhaps the first major promoter of the Beatles in Liverpool. And the other is Alan Williams, who um, uh, was their their, actually their first manager Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and uh, and is also one of the was one of the one of the great characters in. (laughs) Yeah, in in the Beatle world, mm-hmm. and um, uh, Alan did the uh, the 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 New York Times uh, obit for Alan Williams, and um, I, I, I think especially a lot of maybe second third generation fans, they may be somewhat familiar with Alan Williams. They're probably less familiar with Sam Leach, and in fact, when Sam passed, I had to kind of search my my brain to think now where now which what was his connection again and i had to actually had to look it up yeah so i figure uh we'll call on professor cozen (laughs) to uh to give us (laughs) yeah my my part of this week's necrology department is um yeah you know Sam, sam leach was um you know really a, a, a lot less of the story than obviously than Alan Williams was. Yes. Um, uh, you know, he was a promoter. He did put the Beatles on in some big shows. He did have ambitions to manage them and apparently wanted to, he wanted to start a record label and record them. And, uh, but it was, that was even after they had done their Hamburg recordings and uh, with Tony Sheridan and, um, what he said they told him was that they had to wait, you know, this was in the period before they were signed by EMI, that they had to wait for the Hamburg contract to lapse before they could do anything. But that's when he was talking to them about making records. Um, he had big dreams, you know, he put on some, you know, big legendary shows in Liverpool, this one called Operation Big Beat that, you know, had all of the big Liverpool groups. Um, and other things like that. But, uh, you know, uh, even I think for first generation Beatles people, certainly in the U.S., um, Mm -hmm. it's not a name to conjure with. You know, you sort of know the name, you've read it here Mm -hmm. and there. He's he's popped up a number of times. Um, There's I've heard some people who know a lot about this stuff saying that he takes you know a lot of credit that necess- isn't necessarily really is to take um so in fact I, I remember when uh when i went over to see paul's cavern show in 1999 sam leach was on tv a lot um as you know mm-hmm. an, uh, an expert eyewitness type about uh 
their early career, and and, and even then, uh, uh, he didn't have an awful lot to say apart from you know the the concerts and Operation Big Beat and that kind of thing. Um, he, did, he, he did do Beetle Fest, I know, because I saw yes. him in yeah. California. So he uh, he he yeah. appeared at he, not only here, but I think he did him in in the UK also. Mm-hmm. So. Just going to parenthetically say say that he was a a fixture at the the Mersey Beetle convention mm-hmm. in, in Liverpool every August. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So Alan Williams was a much bigger deal, obviously. Um, you know, basically, I, I would say anyone who's followed the story closely knows his part in it or some of his part in it. Um, he, he managed them only very briefly, really. And for a while, there was some doubt about whether he he could really be called their first manager at all. I mean, for a long time, the Beatles were, you know, not willing to say that that much. Um, Mm -hmm. If you look, for instance, in Bill Harry's Beatles Encyclopedia, he notes that um, in the entry about Alan Williams, that the Beatles Mm -hmm. themselves have have, uh, said, you know, not really, but subsequently after that book was published – I think Paul McCartney is referred to him as their first manager. Um, And in all practical, you know, ways, he was their first manager. I mean, he did what a manager does. He he gets them jobs and he takes a percentage. You know, that's Mm -hmm. so, um, uh, yeah, Alan Williams, I mean, he was an interesting guy. He was not a rock and roll fan at all, but he was, Mm -hmm. um, as I think Mark Lewison once put it in, in one of his earlier pieces about about this he was uh, an opportunist and i i think he didn't necessarily mm. mean it that negatively i think he meant it in terms of alan williams could see something that even if it didn't interest him he could tell that this was a good business opportunity and the um gene vincent uh and eddie cochran concerts that were I think they had like a week at the Liverpool Empire. You know, he saw that and he said, hey, you know, I could put on something like this. And he called Larry Parnes in London and said, I'd like to, you know, if they have an extra date, I'd like to bring them back up to Liverpool and do a big spectacular, you know, with lots of um, smaller acts from London and some of the acts from Liverpool because he was already beginning to – sort of represent casting the Casanovas and some of the other groups around there. He ultimately ended up representing also Jerry and the Pacemakers. And for mm-hmm. a while, I think he did Rory, Rory Storm and the Hurricanes, which had Ringo in it. And at one point, once after he began doing this, uh, you know, the Beatles, or at least John, Paul, George and Stu, Stu had become close friends with him. Um, mm-hmm. And they were hanging around the jacaranda, you know, not doing very much. And, you know, as we know from Tune In, the Beatles as such, and it weren't even the Beatles yet, they were a number of names, <laughs> including Stole right. the Quarrymen, um, really were not. They had nothing going. Uh, and at one point, John asked Alan Williams, you know, why don't you do something for us? And Alan Williams uh, didn't even really know they were a group, you know. Uh, and said, uh, okay, well, you know what? And they talked to him, and it was clear that they didn't have a drummer. So he was the one who came up with Tommy Moore. Tommy Moore is a, a, another name that I, you know, I think first-generation Beatle mm. obsessives will know, but maybe not others. Everyone mm-hmm. says Pete Best was the Beatles' first drummer. I, you know, Tommy Moore was way before Pete Best. Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and uh, so Alan Williams got him. He was a guy who was an older drummer. He was a jazz guy. He worked had a, a job at Garston Bottle Works that he didn't want to give up to be a star. Um, and... Uh, So he started playing with them, and the next thing Alan Williams did for them was help them, you know, get into that audition with with his pal Larry Parnes to uh, back Billy Fury on tour. Fury and Parnes both said, yeah, you know what, well, you can can be the backing group, but you got to get rid of the guy with the sunglasses and his back to the audience who can't really play the bass that well. (laughs) And, you know, in in, uh, one of (laughs) – I don't want to say one of the few examples of John Lennon showing loyalty to people because it's not totally true, but he did turn on people a lot. Um, mm-hmm. He he said no, no, you know you, we're we're not getting rid of Stu, and so they lost that job, but got another, um, which was backing Johnny Gentle. 
Um, right. And that was, you know, so Williams was really involved in that transaction, which really was their first tour as a professional group. Now, I got a note from Mark Lewison <laughs> saying, well, okay, they were professional in the sense that they got paid, but they were really not a professional group at the time. And okay, I understand what he means, but you know, prof people who are paid to do a job, that is the operational definition of professional. And this was the Beatles on tour with this guy. I did say in the obit that before Hamburg, they were a disaster. And right. it's also clear that Scotland was before Hamburg. And I mm -hmm. also said that the tour was a disaster. So I, I think readers got the picture, basically. But, um, you know, they ended up losing more in that transaction because um, they had a car crash. He and Lennon didn't get along, um, you know, all kinds of stuff. Well, uh, plus, um, um, in, in fact, Alan told a great story that was in the uh the bbc beatles story about his i guess his live-in girlfriend right tommy moore's live-in girlfriend made him choose who, <laughs> yes <laughs> exactly yeah you i know, have you a feeling all, you can all you can all piss off <laughs> yeah you know it was probably it was probably the right choice for him because i don't see him having gone the distance i mean they he was older than them they didn't get along i mean if the people talk about peace pete best not being part of the group so to speak and in, in terms of personality it, it seems really unlikely that tommy moore could have been really part of the group mm -hmm. really? But, yeah. I mean, he even turned up late for the Larry Parnes audition. And so the pictures that you see of the Beatles have Johnny Hutch playing drums from, yeah. from right. one of the other groups. And uh, the big three, I think. Um, mm -hmm. And Johnny Hutch was, you know, he was like a, a really tough guy who absolutely hated the Beatles. And you look at the pictures of him and he is showing it. Um, don't know how he played. He obviously played well enough for them to sort of get the offer of, uh, you know, the job without Stu, but, but still. Uh, and, and, and then I think more turned up at the end of the audition. So he leaves and the Beatles found their own next drummer, which was a guy named Norman Chapman. They heard him practicing, uh -huh. you know, and just went up and invited him and then he got drafted. Uh, <laughs> So yeah, you know the, the, that. Then for a while, Paul was playing drums, and uh, with John and George sometimes filling in so Paul could sing. But that was when Williams arranged for them to play at the uh, you know the cabaret artists club, backing the stripper Janice. And it's funny because uh, yes, yeah, mm -hmm. you know it's funny because uh, when uh, the. The other night, I mean, when the copy desk at the Times was going through the obit, um, I said they back. He had them backing a stripper, and they and they called and said, "Well, um, so was it just one stripper?" And I said, "Yeah, her name was Janice." <laughs> <laughs> they decided that was too much info. <laughs> but uh, yeah, you know, I mean, be, if only there was a video of that. Yes, really. Yeah, that performance. <laughs> really. Well, sure, but in, and, and obviously a video with a soundtrack because we know that they played the Third Man theme, which we have a little bit of from their early touring years from the outro. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and we know that they played uh, the Sabre Dance, which we have no recording of them doing. So I would love to hear it. God, I'd love to hear that. Yeah, oh, yeah, you know, so, uh, right. But, you know, this is like Williams is getting them jobs like that. Williams was letting them play in the Jacaranda, um, and he was getting them some gigs elsewhere in Liverpool uh, and around Liverpool. So, you know, and then suddenly he had, he had made this um, connection with Koschmitter, Bruno Koschmitter. Right. And Koschmitter turned up and wanted – some Liverpool groups. I mean, there were, there were a couple of transactions where first Alan, Will, Alan Williams tried to sell him some and the tape wasn't working. And uh, uh, that story has been conflated with other, the, the, as if it was a, a tape of the Beatles, but it apparently wasn't. It was like Cass and the Casanovas and um, mm. wasn't working. And so they didn't really do any business. But then Koschmitter ended up coming to England and got together with Williams, and Williams began funneling groups to him. And at that point, the Beatles were so bad, or the reputation was so bad, mm. that um, Cass and the Casanovas wrote to Williams from Germany saying, don't send them here, they'll ruin it for all of us. But 
<laughs> he did send them. Um, that meant getting another drummer, uh, and that's how Pete Best turned up. Pete Best was auditioned in the Blue Angel, which was another one of Alan Williams' clubs. Oh, I should point out, you know, even before all of these other Williams connections and things Williams actually did for them. Um, this is something I picked up from Mark's book uh, from Tune In. Um, John Lennon apparently wrote One After 909 at the Jacaranda. So there's another yeah. connection. And Ringo... Don't, don't, for, don't forget that the Beatles painted the woman's restroom. Yes. Um, the there is some, there is serious right. doubt about that, according to Mark now. First of all, oh, it's, really? it's, it's always said to be Sutcliffe and, and Lennon, but um, it turns out, so far as anybody has been able to ascertain, it was Sutcliffe and um, Rod Murray. Um, oh really? Yeah, and, I, and now I, I, and now Mark says there's even doubt about that. Um, but at the time he wrote "Tune In," I think he felt secure enough to say that it was Murray and Sutcliffe. Because uh, William William says that in his book. Right, William, right. William right. says lots of stuff. I mean, the, the yes. thing about Williams, right. you know, I mean, there's no, a, I, a a lot of the things that he said himself were sort of tall tales, and so. You know, Mark has done an awful lot of research and interviewing and separating, you know, fact from fiction and other people who've done, you know, interviews have noted various inconsistencies. And so it's it's hard to know what's the absolute truth and what isn't. But, uh, yeah, because, you know, the the man who gave the Beatles away, Alan Williams's 1975 autobiography, mm -hmm. you know, has a lot of these stories mm -hmm. um, that, you know – he may have thought they were true when he wrote them, but also he didn't write them. He had a ghostwriter. And whenever you have a ghostwriter, mm. there's also an opportunity for things to go wrong, you know, for for things that the ghostwriter embellishes, even if you haven't embellished it. So mm -hmm. so it's not absolutely 100% reliable. It's a great read, have to say that. So, yes. yeah, you know, also another connection was that Ringo um, – apparently first heard the Beatles at the Jacaranda. Um, right. Or, yeah, I mean, uh, whether he was paying attention to what they were doing. I mean, this was pre-Hamburg, so they probably weren't real good. Um, hmm. And, in fact, we know how they were because we have those 1960 practice tapes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know. Anyway, so, yeah, uh, Williams arranged that first Hamburg trip, which was everything. I mean, as um, Steve quoted Mark Lewison's concise tweet about it, which is, uh, no Williams, no Hamburg, no Hamburg, yep. no Beatles. And that's exactly. absolutely true. You know, Hamburg made them what we all came to love and admire. and oh, But it was oh, oh. in Hamburg uh, that, like, the seeds of the disintegration of the relationship came about. Too. Yes, I was just about to ask about that. Yeah, because, uh, you know, they, while they were there, they ended up negotiating with uh, the top 10 to go perform mm -hmm. there next time they came back. Williams, uh, and, and they decided, therefore, that they didn't need to pay Williams his commission. Um, right. Wi Williams took the view that since they were there on his work, anything that they turned up, through that original contract, he still is entitled to a commission for. I'm not a mm -hmm. lawyer. I don't know which of them is right. But the fact is they negotiated that themselves. And um, so they had a disagreement. He um, threatened to sue them but didn't end up going through with it and, uh, you know, tried to sort of blackball them in Liverpool uh, when they came back. But they were at that point now so hot that, there was no mm -hmm. way that promoters could, you know, not book them. I mean, people wanted to see them. And uh, so, and that basically is the Alan Williams story, except for a brief coda, um, mm -hmm. where in about 1975 or so, he, uh, shortly before he, he published the book, he and had, had come up with the, uh, the Hamburg live tapes um, yes. recorded by King Size Taylor. Um, mm -hmm. And he had this great plan, which was, uh, you know, okay, give me the tapes. I'll take them to Apple and I'll get the Beatles to buy them from us and put them out themselves and we'll all get rich, you know. Uh, and that's basically what he described his meeting with George and Ringo as being about and that he told them. And they said, listen, you know, we, we are. Uh, 
not liquid at the moment is not quite how they put it, but um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, but basically they said no thanks, and so he ended up licensing the or selling the tapes. I'm not sure what his arrangement was, um, but then they came out in 1977, as we all know, and then the Beatles sort of tolerated it for a long time. They never didn't bother about it until Sony had a version of it out. And I guess mm. Sony was a big enough label for them to say, okay, wait a minute. And they sued Sony in 1992 and got them taken off the market. So, um, yeah, and Alan which Williams... Is, which, is, which is ironic, considering that Sony now, you know, not only do they own the publishing, but also, right. you know... <laughs> <that's>, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. And uh, 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 you mentioned um, the fact that in 75 and in that period, he was trying to get the, the Hamburg tapes out. Mm -hmm. I saw Alan Williams at the third of Joe Pope's three mystery tour conventions in Boston. Mm -hmm. uh, this was in the summer of the summer of 76. Mm -hmm. And uh, at that time, he was uh, he was actively trying to, uh, to get a uh, uh, get an American, la get an, uh, an American label uh, to uh, to release the uh, to release the tapes. And I think he played bits of them. Right. I mean, that, there's a bootleg yes. of, 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 of Red Hot that came from someone taping his talk at that yep. convention. Yep, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> You know. So, yeah, you know, and otherwise, you know, he went on to be a, a, a regular figure at Beatle Fests all over the world. He, he promoted the first one in England. Um, mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I, 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 I actually I never actually met him and spoke to him, but I did see him once. Um, it was also on that trip um, when I went to cover Paul at the Cavern. I was walking up Matthew Street. And walking in the other direction, talking to somebody was Alan Williams. And there were a bunch of other people from the Beatles story that I saw in pretty much the same way. And it, it was very surreal. It was like, you know, it's like being in Yellow Submarine or something. Yeah, just, right. <laughs> just walking up the street and you're seeing all of these legendary characters walking past you. But, hmm. uh, yeah, yeah, you know. He stayed in yeah. Liverpool his whole life, you know, and, and mm -hmm. was a, a big figure there. and. This past May, he um, was given a, you know, on a, uh, I can't remember what the, the award was called, but the city of Liverpool gave him a, a, a special award. And, uh, yeah. So, so Start I have a question. Mm -hmm. I have a question. Hmm. Yeah. This whole idea of Alan calling his book The Man Who Gave the Beatles Away. <laughs> so, <Yeah. laughs> considering the fact that you know, the Beatles negotiated their own deal in Hamburg without him. Mm -hmm. Weren't they pretty much giving up on him? Or were they possibly thinking when they went back to Liverpool that they would still be able to use him in some capacity? Well, they did, actually. They, they, they did use him um, from December until about April 61, you know, to, to book dates and things. Um, it's just when they went back in April 61 and decided not to pay him his commission – that the right. split occurred. Um, yeah, it, 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 I guess the man who gave the Beatles away is a more tantalizing title than the man who let the Beatles slip through his fingers. But, mm -hmm. um, but yeah, which is, you're right, it's not accurate. Way, which is the way he puts it basically in the early on in the book, that he, he let them slip through his fingers. Yeah. Right, and that he basically, also that he basically said to Brian Epstein, you know, right, Brian, you take them, you know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> He also said that he told Brian that he wouldn't touch them with a barge pole with exactly. an expletive before a barge pole. Um, <laughs> yeah. Hmm. Yeah, I, I don't know what he could have done differently. I mean, uh, you know, I suppose with wisdom of hindsight and only with wisdom of hindsight, you hmm. could say, okay, you know what, they're going to be so big that I can let this 10% of these Hamburg commissions go and, and continue being involved with them. But, I mean, who knows if – I, I really don't think he could have done for them what Epstein ended up doing with them. No. I think it was think so. the chemistry of Epstein's personality in there is an Epstein's particular gumption, you know? Right. Mm -hmm. right. But, I mean, Williams had some of that gumption, too. I mean, he called up Larry Parnes out of nowhere to do the Cochran Vincent show, you know, and had a little partnership there for a while. So, uh, you know, who knows what he would have been willing to do. 
Right, and he was, and he was a character. I mean, he he's got a incredible oh reputation as a as a character. I, uh, I, I just published a piece uh, this morning with uh, uh, from Charles Rosenay who talked all about him, and he sure. said the guy was. He said the guy, you know, uh, he was a. Uh, he called him ornery, and uh, mm-hmm. but he also said he was a very he was a nice guy too. And uh, I mean, the the one story I, that I think that has gone through the years that you always hear with with Alan Williams is that uh, he loved to uh, I guess to uh, tip a few is uh, would be the nice one. Oh yeah. <laughs> so oh, yeah. yeah. You know, he was very much that kind of a guy. I mean, he was very much that kind of a guy. So. Especially at the conventions, all you had to do basically was you know. Bring him to the bar, and uh, you know, get a get a couple of drinks into him, and he would have stories up the wazoo. Whether how many of them were true, who knows? But mm-hmm. but yeah. still, he would have a, you know a million a million different stories. But if nothing if nothing else, he was one of the the bigger characters in the Beatles story. Absolutely, mm-hmm. the way, the way no question. Is. And and you start to wonder. Of you know, other than maybe the contemporaries like you know, like Jerry Marsden and Frida Kelly, and um, maybe a, a few other people from the bands in, in Liverpool, you know, of the you know, kind of the old guard, who's left? Billy mm-hmm. J. Kramer. Yeah. Well, yeah, Billy J. That's what I mean. The, you know, other than the, you know, Billy J and, and Jerry and you yeah, know, maybe. let's not let's not run down the list. Uh, I, yeah, I, I, the list is dwindling year by year. Yeah, it's true. And God, and God forbid, who's who's gonna who we're gonna lose this year? You know. Yeah, and speaking of which, obviously we had this uh, this one two punch at the very at the very end of the year, but as a matter of fact, uh, you know, as I mentioned earlier, the 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 music world seemed to be particularly hard hit by the number of uh, departures during 2016 and the uh, and a number of them had connections to the Beatle world besides Alan Williams and Sam Leach and uh, Steve has uh, has the whole list well yeah I have a what I think is a pretty good list um, and again it, I mean some of these are more tenuous than others as far as connections to the Beatles go not a, you know but there's some pretty strong ones you got Robert Stigwood mm-hmm. um, you've got David Bowie uh, of course you've got Sir George Martin I uh, can't uh, you know Chip Smallman Chip Smallman who who, um, who did those uh, sessions with Ringo uh, Henry McCullough Leon Russell, of course. Uh, um, that's one that's personally gotten to me. I've been mm. listening to a lot of Leon lately. Um, Greg Lake from the All Star Band. We mentioned George Michael. We talked about Sam Leach, Alan, Alan Williams, Maurice Ho- uh, White from um, from Earth, Wind, and Fire, uh, who did uh, "Gotta Get You Into My Life." Great uh, person too. Right, uh, mm-hmm. a pr- prince who did the uh, that great solo on that uh, um, uh, while my guitar while my guitar down at the at the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Mm-hmm. Scott Scotty Moore, who was a huge huge influence to George Harrison, mm-hmm. um, and also was, engineered um, Boku of Blues. Right, right. right. Uh, Bobby V, uh, who did the original "Take Good Care of My Baby" that the Beatles later covered. And of course, we mentioned Carrie Fisher already, and I mean, we may have left out a couple there, but I mean that's a pretty, pretty extensive list of everybody, you know. Yeah. So. Yeah. Billy it, Paul. Mm-hmm. All is there, right. Is, yes. is there a Beatle connection there that I'm not aware? Yeah. Of? Um, Just that he he had he had a hit on the R and B charts with his cover of "Let Him In." That was it. Yes. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It was not a good year for the music world in general, but uh, Beatle connections were were pretty uh, were pretty uh, numerous there. So mm-hmm. now uh, swerving uh, about three hundred and sixty degrees uh, to, some, to something uh, <laughs> to something uh, much much more positive. Uh, Paul McCartney made a little bit of news over uh, over New Year's weekend. Right, yes. Steve. Yes, yes, he did. He <laughs> he showed up with uh, he played uh, with um, the Killers, the killers. Uh, yeah. at uh, St. Bart's at a 
at a, I guess, a, a private Christmas party uh, for, uh, um, I don't have the article in front of me, I can't remember the guy's name, but uh, um, he played, he sang uh, Helter Skelter, and the, uh, oh, and the, the clip of it was it was great. Uh, 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 it's Robin Abramovich was the guy uh, was the party, and um, the version he did, he sounded great doing Helter Skelter. It was a beautiful version. There's a couple of uh, videos of it around. I did an article for Billboard and and, and clipped together some of the videos. Um, but uh, yeah, there's some there's some decent videos of that that you can that you can find out there. But the bill, my billboard article has uh, the one that the killers posted, and a couple from YouTube. Uh, so, um, if you want to yeah. see it, if you haven't seen it, but it's a, yeah, it's a great. Ver- he did a great version. Sounded good. Sounded good. We'll we'll see what happens come uh, April when he goes. And, and also, he announced he's going back on tour again. <laughs> so mm-hmm. uh, that's going to be interesting to see how far he gets. Uh, it's starting in Japan. And uh, people are already wondering where he's going to go next. And I know people are posting, will he come to Australia, which he, for some reason, has has been avoiding. And I don't know why. I don't know what that uh, – the only thing I can think of, and guys, what do you think, is that uh, the time lag for him is just too much now. He doesn't, he doesn't like that, although he is going to Japan. So I don't know what the, what the problem is with Australia. Yeah, once he's in Japan, he might as well just hop over there. Again. Yeah, exactly. maybe it's not maybe that maybe, far. Right? Maybe he will. Who knows? I don't know. But nobody right. ever asks him. <laughs> you know? no, well, maybe we should ask him. Maybe we should get him on, get him on this show. <laughs> right? <laughs> Why won't you play Australia? Yeah, Paul, come on the show. We, we'll, we'll, we'll we'll take you. We'll, we'll, I I think we'll have you on the show. I don't think there, there's a problem there. But, and I'd be most curious to see if he's going to shake up his set list at all. So, oh, I'm. I would bet. I would probably bet not. It's going to happen. Um, I would also <laughs> bet. Obviously, two different but, opinions right there. Anyway. I, yeah. I would also. I, I would bet he'll change at least one song for the. Well, yeah. That's, I mean, that's <laughs> not a lot. Yeah, that's, well, I mean, that's not. Sh- that's not shaking it up. <laughs> he didn't change. He didn't change a whole lot this year. Um, you know. But I would bet that that, that that he'll do about the same. Because uh, the, the big question is how long will the tour be? And starting in yeah. April, starting in April means he's. It looks like he's already cut it back a little bit, and I would not be surprised if that continues. And but I would also not be surprised if there were more dates. And that's uh, so we'll see what happens. Let's yeah. hope he plays the states. That's there's no yeah, guarantee I've, of that. So. Right, there's no guarantee, and I've but yep. I've already heard from people, you know, wishing that he would play in various areas, and and obviously there's no way to know at, at this point, but uh, we'll see what happens. Well, he's good at tackling areas that he hasn't played for a while. He's very aware of that. So. What's mm-hmm. left? What is left after the last couple of years? I mean, unless he wants to play. Uh, East McKeesport or something like that. <laughs> well, there's, there is there is Portland, Maine. Um. <laughs> That's true. That's true. But he maybe yeah. he may not do Portland, Maine, just because he knows. Um, <laughs> or Pittsburgh. Or Pittsburgh. Yeah. Well, no, he's played Pittsburgh, hasn't he? Yeah, but not not since I've been here. <laughs> oh, okay. I'm he's not sure never... what the, I'm not sure there actually is a venue around here of the size he is currently used to. Play would you care? Or, would you isn't, care? Would he, well, he might. Yeah. Oh, that's true. He might. <laughs> I mean, hey, you can come play in my living room as far as I'm concerned. You know, right? <laughs> Doesn't need to be a big venue for me. <laughs> no, that's true. He has never played in New Haven, Connecticut. Really? Uh oh. Uh oh. Mm. There huh. you go. See, and, was di- and Dylan has played in both these places. Yep. Dylan has yeah. played in Portland and New Haven, so hey, come on, Paul. Yeah. Okay, huh? but he, he there was a possibility he was going to play the Yale Bowl mm. in 1993. Wow, there was a lot really? of talk about it, and it, he backed out of it. Mm-hmm. Paul has played San Jose and San Francisco. I don't think he's ever played Monterey though, which is about a couple hours south of where I am. Um, so that would be that would be a interesting uh, place for him to go. 
Or, yeah. Are the yeah. um are the are the 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 fairgrounds or whatever they were called where the Monterey Pop Festival was held? Are they do that does that still exist? I don't you know I don't know. I've se- I've I've been there. Um I was there shortly after um as a matter of fact when we came into California we stopped there uh what turned out to be the fairgrounds just after and I saw the stage. But I don't know if they're still there. I believe they are. I mean, I believe that. I don't know if the, if it, how different it looks. But it probably looks a little different now. But the, I would assume the fairgrounds are still there. Because given that the uh, this June is the 50th anniversary of uh, of the Monterey Pop Festival, and since Paul was on the board mm-hmm. for the festival, that would be uh, that would be a nice little touch. Mm. Mm-hmm. I, hey, we doubt, could, I highly doubt it'll happen, but we could start a rumor. Yeah, exactly. I'm sure. I'm sure somebody will pick up on it and write it and say they've heard it somewhere. <laughs> right. Well, he he did something for a candlestick park. That's true. Did. That he did. So mm-hmm. we will see. We will see. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you could tie in the uh, the three anniversaries in June. You know, the the Sergeant Pepper anniversary, the All You Need Is Love anniversary. And the and Monterey. I would not at all be surprised if something happens with Pepper. I would not. Well, but we will see. Mm-hmm. We will you, see. You, we we will we've see. said we've said before they're not into anniversaries. Mm, but Pepper, they've also Pepper. They may be because yeah, this is this is a big past. one. Yeah, yeah, because when they did roll out the first batch of CDs, right. Sergeant Pepper was the only one that got its kind of its own its own separate release and mm-hmm. was packaged <laughs> at least a little better than the than the the others had been. Right. right. And the whole schedule was built around being able to release Sergeant Pepper on its twentieth yes. anniversary. So Yeah, exactly. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. So so we shall see. All righty. So uh, I think we uh, we will uh, we will wrap it up. This is unfortunately this uh, this discussion has been primarily about people dying, but uh, still it was a uh, it was a very interesting uh, interesting discussion. And Steve, how do people get in touch with us? Uh, you can get in touch with the show at uh, Things We Said Today radio show at gmail.com we have a facebook page things we said today radio show uh, or beals beals show fans and we're also on twitter at things we said fab and we will be choosing the winner we haven't done it yet of the contest and so we do have the the contest is over we have new and several several entries we thank all of you for responding and we will announce the winners soon perhaps and what, next week. And, what, and the prizes again were the prize were the blue the blu-ray deluxe version two copies of the blu-ray deluxe version of eight days a week yes and we thank everyone for writing in we've gotten a great response to it yes yeah. we did mm-hmm Alan, how do people get in touch with you? Oh, probably uh, the easiest way is on Facebook at either Alan Cozen or Alan Cozen Remixed, or just through okay. the group email. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Same, pretty much same here. Facebook, Al Sussman, Twitter at ASUSS49, or through Beetle Fan Magazine, www.beetlefan.com. Uh, Mr. Michaels, how? Uh, first of all, I'm sure you have various uh, things, contests, and all kinds of things going on on your uh, uh, on your website, and also uh, you're going to mention your new affiliates for every little thing. Hmm. Okay, on the website, I have a special contest going on right now where you can win five tremendous prizes all in one package. This is the biggest contest I've run of the past year. It's kind of uh, crossing over into 2017. I am giving away the Beatles 1 Plus CD and DVD, 8 Days a Week Blu-ray Deluxe, uh, the Beatles Live at the Hollywood Bowl CD, Pure McCartney, Double CD, and Kiddo Tools book, Songs You Were Singing. You can win that in a special contest. Just go to my website for all the details, kenmichaelsradio.com. There's also a Beatles trivia and games page where you can win one of nine prizes every single week. 
and those same five prizes are on there too. <laughs> so you can win them individually on the Beatles trivia and games page. You can follow me on Facebook at Ken Michaels, and my email address is every little thing at att.net. And as Al said, this has been a good time the last few weeks. I've been getting new stations taking my syndicated radio show, Every Little Thing, one of which is a station that's actually based out of Connecticut, and they have all kinds of innovative programming. Uh, they're called Cygnus Radio, C-Y-G-N-U-S Radio.com. I'm on Sunday mornings at 11 a.m. there. That's Eastern Standard Time. Um, I'm going to be very soon uh, this coming weekend, I believe, on a station in Alabama, uh, which <laughs> it's an AM political station. Go figure. But it's Uh-oh. Good to <laughs> hey, mm. whoever wants my show can have. But the best thing to do is really to go on my website. There is a page that says every little thing. It has a list of all the stations that carry the show and the broadcast dates and times. And um, if they carry my syndicated show, they have access to all my shows. So at any time during the week, all these stations can be playing different shows of mine. It's not like it usually is in syndication. Every station plays the same version, you know, the newest show. It doesn't always have to be that way, but um, it's right there. But I have somewhere it's uh, 20, 21 stations right now, and it's growing. So, where? So if, so if every little thing um, is being heard on an AM station in Alabama, that must account for why Ringo was wearing an Alabama t shirt. <laughs> Over you the figured weekend. out everything, Al. You Absolutely. Figured. That's got to be. That's got to be it. That's got to be it. The that said the Crimson Tide, right? Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Very okay, cool. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> Otherwise, um, is isn't Rick Lover from? Oh no, he's from Georgia, right? No, 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 no. The uh, Rick's uh, Rick's from. Well, actually, Rick's originally from Tennessee, right? Okay. Right, Alan. I don't know. Yeah, I think he's originally from Tennessee, uh, but uh, but of course uh, Bill King, the grand high exalted mystic ruler of, uh, of Beetle Fan <laughs> Magazine, uh, he's he's from the University of Georgia. So I'm sure uh, have, I haven't heard any reaction yet, but uh, he probably couldn't have been too terribly happy about seeing Ringo in an Alabama T-shirt. Mm, okay, well, you know all those SEC ties. So anyway, <laughs> this has been uh, this has been a fun, dis- well, uh, more or less a fun discussion. But uh, wanted to wish uh, you folks a happy new year, and as a as I keep saying, let's hope that 2017 is a whole lot better year for uh, for all of us. And uh, for uh, Steve Marinucci and Alan Cozen and Ken Michaels, this is Al Sussman. And uh, uh, we thank you for listening to Things We Said Today, and we will see you next time.